<clears throat> this morning's scripture reading is Psalm 34 of David when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech who drove him away and he left. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who, lack, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongues from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to blot out their names from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Please pray with me. Gracious God, again, we thank you for the gift and the opportunity that is ours to assemble together on the Lord's Day. We thank you that week after week we come into your presence and we are encouraged to be with brothers and sisters in Christ. Our spirits are lifted up as we sing and hear music sung to praise you and to bring you glory. And we thank you, Lord, that you faithfully deliver to us your word. We thank you that it is true and that it is relevant and pertinent to our lives. And Father, we pray that this morning as we look again at your word and at the words of David that you prompted him to record through the leading of your Holy Spirit, that you would take that truth, Lord, and that it might be applied to our hearts and our lives, that you would minister to us in accordance with our needs. You, sovereign God, know exactly where every person is in their life and their life situation and you know what we have need of. And we thank you, Lord, that you are sufficient to meet those needs and that you can speak your truth and your love and your grace into our lives. And so we humbly ask, Father, that you might speak to us this day, that we might walk away from this place encouraged, strengthened, challenged, convicted as your Holy Spirit sees we have need of and we pray father that we might be drawn closer to you this day because we have spent this time with you and with one another we pray these things in jesus name amen we are doing a series uh, from the book of psalms a uh, prayer journey during uh, the lenten season and we are looking at different uh, psalms that uh, speak to us and really in helping us prepare to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, to celebrate what he has done for us. Last week we looked at a uh, prayer in concerning confession, a confession of our sins and our need to, to be cleansed and reconciled to God. And today we're going to look at a prayer uh, that Barbara read for us, a prayer of seeking. And <clears throat> before we jump into the text itself, I, I want to give you the context. I, I was pleased that Barbara read to you uh, the, the beginning, uh, which says, of David, David's the author of this psalm, 
when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he left. Uh, in, in our translations of the Bible, that doesn't even show up as verse 1. It kind of shows up as uh, a preamble to the, uh, the psalm itself. If we were reading a Hebrew Bible, that would be verse 1, because actually that is the context for the writing of this psalm. So let me kind of fill in the story for you so that we get more out of it. Have you ever heard one of uh, a song that really moved you and you thought, man, I would really like to know what was in the, uh, the, the songwriter's mind when they wrote that song because it, it just there's got to be a story behind it. Um, well, there's a story behind this psalm, this song of praise and worship, and David gives us a little hint. Um, to set it up, uh, this, is, this is what happened to David. Um, Saul, the first king of Israel, had disobeyed God repeatedly, but severely enough that God said he was withdrawing his favor from God and Saul was no longer going to be king. And Saul raised up Samuel, his prophet, and said, I want you to go and anoint the new king of Israel. And he sent him to the house of Jesse, and uh, Samuel went one by one through the sons of Jesse, and none of them were who God wanted to be king. And he said, don't you have any more sons? And he said, well, my youngest, but he's out tending the flock. He said, well, go get him. And so David's nothing more than a teenager at the time, and they bring David in, and the Spirit of the Lord tells Samuel, this is the one, anoint him king. Okay, that's fine. God has chosen his new king for the people of Israel. Only problem, Saul's still on the throne. Okay? David uh, shows his leadership and his, uh, his power in the Spirit of God a little bit later when Dad sends him to the front lines where Israel is facing off against the Philistines and there's a valley between them and they, they've just been kind of camped off opposite one another and the Philistines have been taunting the Israelites for some time, blaspheming God, and they have this giant of a man, Goliath, who says he'll battle anyone from the Israelite army and that could settle the battle and then there wouldn't be a waste of a lot of life. And David is just absolutely consumed by the Spirit of God. And hearing these people blaspheming God, he says he'll go up against him. And we all know the story. I mean, uh, Saul offers to put his armor on David. David tries it on. It doesn't fit. It's like he's too little for that. And he, he, he uses the weapon of his choice, which as a... As a shepherd boy, he had a sling, and he would use stones to drive off uh, an animal that might attack the, the sheep. And, and so he goes up against Goliath, and with one stone, he fell that giant and slayed him. And so David becomes famous. He's taken into the palace where Saul is, and Saul has these fits of rage and anger and jealousy, and on numerous occasions, he tries to kill David to the point that David escapes the palace and he's running for his life. And finally, David decides it's no longer safe for me to hang around even in the country proper where my people are. I I've got to get out of here. And he goes to Gath, where the Philistines are. Now, you might read through that word Gath and not even know well, what is that about. That's a town. Gath is where Goliath is from. David escaped and went to Goliath's hometown. Um, not maybe the safest place to go. Uh, and he, he's there, and, and now he's been basically captured by some of the guards of the king of Gath, and brought to the king of Gath, and David has got to get out of there. And in 1 Samuel chapter uh, 21, it tells us the story. David, this mighty warrior David, acts like he's crazy. He's insane. 
He starts writing gibberish on the wall. He, he's, he's drooling all over his beard. And the guys present him and they say, this is David, the one that everybody sings about. And they quote the song that was sung. Saul, he slayed his 1,000, but David, he slayed his 10,000. And they see David as a threat. The king looks at this insane-looking man and he says, don't I have enough madmen in this country? Send him away. And David is rescued. He's saved. He's delivered. And David looks back at that time in his life and he writes this psalm about seeking God and God's direction and depending upon God to deliver you in, uh, in times of need. And you have up there on the screen the ABCs of seeking the Lord because actually that's exactly what he wrote. We can't tell it in English, but in Hebrew, this is an acrostic, and he starts with the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and with each verse, he's working his way through the alphabet in Hebrew, with the exception of one that he doubles up on. And I, we don't know for sure why, but we have to assume, just like in the English language, sometimes it's just fi hard to find words that start with a certain letter. But he's got, exactly, uh, he's, he's got exactly 22 verses, 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So the ABCs of seeking the Lord. But David is in this situation where it's almost like, you know, he, he went from a bad spot to a worse spot, right? We have that saying, you jumped out of the frying pan into the fire, and that's exactly kind of David's context for this psalm. So what does this psalm teach us? What should we learn? First and foremost is we should seek the Lord. We should seek the Lord. Um, and there isn't a time in which we should not, but specifically in this psalm, it reminds us of some important times in which we should. And the first one is when troubles come. In verse 6, it says, this poor man called, he's referring to himself, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all of his troubles. Verse 17, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all of their troubles. Verse 19, the righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from all of them. Ever feel like you're in the middle of troubles? Got some troubles today? What's the counsel of the Word of God? Seek Him. Uh, call out to Him. Um, <clears throat> the second thing it reminds us is we need to seek the Lord when your heart breaks. Verse 18. Um, it says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. When you're hurting, when you're brokenhearted, maybe not even for yourself. Maybe it's for someone else. Maybe their situation just breaks your heart and you, you, you feel overcome by it. Um, that's a time to seek the Lord, to look to Him, to ask Him. And, and in that same verse, verse 18, uh, it's when you are crushed in spirit, you need to seek the Lord as well. Um, crushed in spirit, I kind of take that as, you know, when, when you're just hit by something and it almost just takes your breath away. It's, it's like you've been hit in the gut and you, you have no air. You're, 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 you're gasping. Barbara, thank you for your genuineness this morning. Uh, thank you that within the context of the family here, you can say, I want prayer for this family that I love that has lost someone. We, we, we saw right when she began someone whose breath was taken away by some bad news. And the counsel of the Word of God is we need to seek the Lord in those times. And that's exactly what she modeled for us this morning in asking for prayer for them. Um, we need to go to Him, and we need to go to Him first. 
rather than at a last minute. When I was working uh, at the hospital in Haiti as a missionary, um, the, the hospital was called the Good Samaritan Hospital, based upon the story that Jesus told about the Good Samaritan. But the locals, the Haitian people, did not call it the, the Hospital of the Samaritan, but rather they called it the Hospital of the Good God. And they believed and understood that the missionaries were uh, actually speaking and ministering on behalf of a good God. Now, sadly, what would happen is probably 80 to 90% of all the patients that came through the hospital came to the hospital for treatment only after they had gone to the witch doctor two or three times and unsuccessfully got any answers to their ailments or problems. And finally, they would go to the hospital. Now, before you and I in our sophisticated society look down at them and say, you know, well, why didn't they go to the hospital in the first place? Let me ask you, how often do you, when you're faced with difficulties, try to solve things yourself and work it all out on your own instead of looking to the Lord first, asking him first, seeking his will in the situation and giving it to him to direct you? We need to seek the Lord in all of the ways in which we can be accosted and affected by life in this world. Second thing we need to uh, take from what David said to us in this passage is we need to keep the right perspective. We need to keep the right perspective. In verse 4, he says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. In verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. First thing from that, in keeping the right perspective, is really, in a sense, seeking the Lord as well. It's calling on the Lord. It's calling out to him. In, in those moments, immediately, just to call to him. I can remember a time... Um, in which we were traveling, the kids were young, and we were going to Florida to visit uh, Melinda's folks. And um, we were on the expressway in the state of Florida. And uh, we're going 70 miles an hour. And, and I'm in the far right-hand lane. Uh, someone pulls out quickly in front of me. There's a car just to the left of us. And as they pull out, I see... There's someone in my lane with flashers on. They are completely stopped. And the first thing that I hear is Melinda goes, help us, Lord. I, I could go nowhere. There was nowhere to go. There was no moving out of this. Just press on the brake and pray. And I am telling you, it was beyond anti-lock brakes abilities that got us stopped that day. You call out to him. You seek him in all circumstances, knowing that he answers. Second one is to know that the Lord answers, um, that he answers us. Now, I will give a little caveat to the Lord answering us, we need to know that in our heads, but we need to know it in our hearts as well. We need to understand that our God does delight in answering his children and answering their needs. Will we always get what we want, like Kim asked the children? No. Will we get what we need? Yes. But we need to understand when we come to him, we need to exercise faith and truly trust him for the answers. Um, it's not in your outline, but you're, if you're a note taker, you can jot down James uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, because James makes it really clear that when we come to God, we need to truly exercise faith that he's going to answer us and give us what we need and not doubt. James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, that's knowing what to do and how to handle a situation, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. 
But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. In other words, what God is saying is when you ask, you need to truly believe and not doubt me that I will answer you, that I will lead you in the right direction. Psalm 23, probably one of the most familiar psalms. Um, He he promises that he will lead us. Uh, He In verse 3, he guides me in the paths of righteousness for his what? Namesake. He promises, if you truly want to honor me and live your life for me, I promise you, I will guide you in the right path for his own namesake. In other words, he's counting on us to be good representatives of him And he will lead us in that right path. We need to seek him, and we need to know that he answers, but we need to fully exercise faith in the God who answers. And the third thing in keeping the right perspective is we need to fear God above all else. There are a lot of things. I mean, David rightfully, when he's standing before the king at Gath, feared for his life, I'm certain. We can be in situations where rightfully we can have reason to have fear, but we need to keep that fear in perspective that is nothing compared to who our God is. Everything you and I will ever face in life is tiny to God. Tiny to God. You know, It can be a huge, looks like insurmountable problem to you or me. But I'm telling you, it's nothing to the living God who spoke everything into existence and who conquered death for you and me. Are you or I ever going to face anything bigger than the grave? Jesus conquered it. If you're a Christian here this morning, you are trusting that Jesus Christ, who died and rose from the dead will raise you from the dead, right? You are trusting that the moment that you breathe your last, you will be ushered into the presence of the living God and experience His glory for eternity, right? If you can trust Him for that, can you not trust Him for every day? If you can trust Him for that great thing, can we not give Him the stuff that really messes us up on a daily basis. You see, the perspective, I mean, it's really important to, to recognize we, we, we fear him and we revere him above all else, and it puts everything into the rightful perspective because I think the devil delights, absolutely delights in magnifying the problems in our eyes so that our God shrinks down in our eyes rather than is to the rightful perspective of who he is and what he's capable of. Uh, Jesus, in preparing his disciples to go out two by two and to uh, perform miracles and witness on his behalf in Matthew chapter 10, it's not in your outline, but verses 28 and 29, he's giving them a pep talk and he says, Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. He's saying fear God more than anybody you face, he says. And then he he kind of applies it. He's saying how good God is and how caring God is. He says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside my father's care? And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. He's saying, my father God cares about these little birds and knows every single one that drops over dead. 
And he says, does he not care more for you and me? We need to understand that God is greater than any problem you or I will ever face. So we seek the Lord. We keep things in proper perspective. And then lastly, we need to take the high road. You know, when you're, when you're accosted with different problems in life, and sometimes those problems involve other people and how they treat us, you need to choose to do the right thing and take the high road. Here David is describing um, the situation he went through in which God delivered him, and in the middle of it, he does something really kind of strange. Um, suddenly, in verse 12, he says, whoever, uh, whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good things, and now he starts to preach. He says, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. He's saying, do the right thing. Take the high road. So the ABCs of this, take the high road. The first one is do good regardless. Regardless of what happens to you, regardless of what someone does against you, you do the right thing anyway. You do the right thing even whether there seems to be an immediate payoff or not. Um, scripture is always the best commentary on Scripture. And in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, and I give the reference in, in your outline. I'm not going to read it, but Peter is talking to the church, and the church is being persecuted. And Peter says, you know, if bad things happen to you because you've done wrong, well, what reward is there in that? But if you've done right and you're still having bad things happen to you and people attack you, he's saying, hold on and do the right thing. Honor God and put him first. And God ultimately will reward. There was a time in my life in which um, shortly after college I got a job and, and the job was going well and suddenly... Uh, I got a message from the department head that we all had to uh, do a certain thing that was really against my Christian conscience. And so I made it known to my supervisor, I do not feel comfortable doing that, and I, 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 I cannot do that. Well, the, uh, the message went up through the chain to the point that I got called into the manager's office and, uh, and it became very clear that this was very personal to him. And he basically said, you will do this. And if you don't do this, not only will you be fired, but you will not find a job because you will not get a good reference. And I left that meeting that day and I, I, I can truly tell you that I did a lot of praying because I thought, Lord, what did I do wrong? I mean, uh, in, in every other way, and I even ask, you, you know, I, 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 have I not been doing my job properly? No, you've been doing your job quite well, but this is what is now expected. And to make a long story short, before he could execute his um, vendetta or justice on me as he saw a fit, I, I made no effort to change anything, but I got a call from another department within the same place in which I was working, and they said, we're starting up this new department, and we think you would be good at it. And I was not only transferred out, but I was transferred You do the right thing, and God will work things out. You take the high road, and in taking the high road also, you let Jesus be your example. 
you let Jesus be your example. Um, well, Pastor, I know that Jesus is supposed to be our example, but where do you get that in Psalm 34? Well, let, let me tell you. In, in verse 20 of Psalm 34, uh, David writes this by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he's speaking about the righteous man who may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from all of them. Verse 20 um, Verse 20, he says, and he protects all of his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Now, I, I, I can tell you, I am I'm certain that David did not know whom he was writing about at that moment. But John, the disciple of Jesus, who was at the cross the day that Jesus was crucified, recognized that God was fulfilling a prophetic statement about his son. Because in John chapter 19, it tells us that it, the Sabbath is coming. Those three that were on the cross, Jesus and those two thieves that were on each side of him, uh, they had to get them off the cross. They could not hang on, the, on their crosses uh, into the Sabbath. And so the, the soldiers were told that they were to break their legs by breaking their legs that meant that no longer could they lift up and breathe and basically that hastened their death so they would suffocate and they came up to the first one and he was still alive they broke his legs they come up to the second one they broke his they came up to the lord jesus and discovered he's already dead and john says they didn't break his legs and he quotes psalm 34 that the righteous not one of his bones will be broken what is the takeaway from that follow the Lord's example now did did everything physically work out right for Jesus by no means he was executed right but was his life used in the manner in which God intended it Absolutely, because without him, we would be without hope. Follow the Lord's example. Do the right thing. And lastly, know that there is a greater plan. There is a greater plan. You and I, God chose to have you live on this planet Earth. Every single life that has come about is because of God's will and plan. And he has a reason for each one of us. And that is a marvelous thing to understand. That is a marvelous thing to accept that, that God has a plan. Now, I cannot tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt what was in David's mind when he's facing this king in Goliath's hometown. But one thing I am certain of, David had this in the back of his mind. God has anointed me king through his prophet Samuel. God intends for me to be on the throne and shepherd and lead his people. And this moment is not the end. He didn't know the way in which God would deliver him. He didn't know exactly how everything would work, but he knew there was a plan. And there is a plan for each of you and me as well. And if you have given your life to Jesus Christ, we know the end of the plan is that you will be in glory in heaven forever, right? And that means that every step along the way in your path is to prepare you for that ultimate destiny. And if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ and have not given your life to him, then I want you to know that his plan and purpose is that you would trust his son as your savior because he loves everyone. And the Bible makes it really clear. He does not want any to perish. 
but all to be saved, all to be delivered. And so the offer is extended on behalf of God through Jesus Christ, his son. Trust him. Receive the gift of everlasting life. Seek him while he may be found. Pray with me, would you? Lord God, thank you that seeking you is not like playing hide-and-seek. Thank you that we don't have to rush around in our life and somehow conjure up the answers or look for you, but that you are always just a prayer away that you are ready to be found, that you are gracious and good, that you are more than willing to bestow upon us wisdom, understanding, answers, provision, deliverance. And Lord God, I pray for every single person that is here this day. You know what they are facing. You know decisions that need to be made. You know direction that needs to be discerned. You know what we have need of, Lord, encouragement. And I pray, Father, that for each of us, this wouldn't be a moment in worship, but this would be a starting point in which we go forward in our lives with you, that we truly would seek you seek you out in everything that we do that we might follow the path you have set out for us so that our lives might be used to point other people to you as surely as David wrote this psalm and remembered that event in his life and wrote this psalm to encourage others to seek you May our life be used to encourage others to seek you also. And Lord, I pray, especially for any here this day, who the first step of seeking is to say, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that you died on the cross and rose from the dead to pay for my sins. And I trust you with my life and with my eternity. I ask you to come into my life, forgive me of my sins, and cleanse me. So that one day I will be able to be with you in heaven. And I pray that from this day forward, I might live each day for you. And to make you know. And all God's people said, Amen. We're going to close out our service by singing Wherever He Leads, I'll Go, a beautiful hymn that describes, uh, basically, uh, it's, a, it's an affirmation of dedication. Hey, God, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. And that only happens when we're really seeking Him. So, Uh, As we stand and sing this, I extend this invitation. If you uh, uh, want to give your life to Jesus Christ, if you prayed and asked him to come in, if you want to join this church family, maybe you're going through a hard time and you just want some prayer. There will be people that will pray with you. You respond as the Lord leads. Wherever he leads, I'll go.